Welcome to another episode of the Christian Combatives Podcast. Today we're actually going to be doing something a little bit differently than normal. We're not going to do an interview or a discussion or even a long-winded monologue. Rather, I'm going to be doing something that some people have asked for in the past. I'm going to be uploading some sermon audio. Now, this is different than the, the things that you see or you hear on the YouTube channel or on the podcast. Some people have asked me before, are you this annoying and obnoxious when you're in the pulpit? And maybe, but not in the same way. Um, so you'll actually get to hear how I, I, I deliver the sermon to the congregation. Again, it'll probably sound different than what you're used to for a variety of reasons. Now, the three sermons that you're going to hear back to back to back, hopefully all fit together fairly well. They are the Monday Thursday sermon, the Good Friday sermon, and of course, the Easter morning sermon. The Good Friday, or let's start with the Monday Thursday sermon. The Monday Thursday sermon, uh, it asks the question, why does the Lord's Supper matter? And it gets into the text from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'll read that before I start the sermon, so don't worry, you don't have to have it memorized. Though it's not bad to know by heart. The next sermon doesn't need any text. If you're familiar with the crucifixion account, it is, it is asking the question, why did Christ have to die on Good Friday? This is a question in particular my children have asked me. They say, well, we don't want Jesus to die. Why did Jesus have to die? It's sad that Jesus died. So we get into that a little bit in, in the Good Friday sermon. And then finally, we have the Easter morning sermon, and this goes into the phrase, He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. And why we use the phrase, He is risen, not He has risen or He was risen, something like that. And I get into that in, in the sermon, so I'm not going to spoil that. So the three sermons are going to be back-to-back but before I begin, I'd like to read the text from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 20 through through 32, and then I'll just let you enjoy the sermons from there. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 and following in the ESV. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, The cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Thus far our text. Now please enjoy the Monday Thursday sermon followed by Good Friday and Easter. God bless you and take care. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon this evening comes from the epistle reading, which you have just heard, the reading from St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Now, Holy Week contains some of the most important events in all of human history. Outside of Holy Week, obviously, there are things like the creation of the universe. It's no trivial matter. The birth of Christ is pretty important. But in many ways, the Christian church is defined by what happened in the three weeks, in the three days of the Holy Week. In many ways, the Tridium, the three-day festival of Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter Sunday, are how we get our Christian identity. This evening we celebrate Monday Thursday. This is the and the institution of one of Christ's greatest gifts to the church, the Lord's Supper. Because this was such an important and valuable gift to Christians, it's only right that we pay very close attention to what the Bible says about these things, what the Bible says about the Lord's Supper. And we treat the Lord's Supper with utmost seriousness and dignity. In Paul's letter to the Corinthian church, he restates what Jesus said at the Last Supper. Now you remember at the Last Supper, Jesus is sitting around with his disciples, he breaks bread, he passes the, the cup of wine around, uh, and he says quite a few things. And then Paul later restates this, in his letter to the Corinthians. In particular, Jesus took the bread, he gave thanks, and said, this is my body, as he gave it to those around him. In the same way, the cup of wine, he declared, this is the new covenant in my blood, or this is the new testament in my blood. Same meaning, different word. By these words, Jesus made it clear that these things, the bread and the wine, were not just symbols. They were not just allegories. They were not just empty pictures or signs. Humanity already had bread and wine. 
It already existed at that time. That's why Jesus had it at the, at the supper. It was already there. He hadn't, if he was just giving bread and wine to people, he wouldn't be giving anything new. Adding symbolic meaning to the bread and wine wouldn't really be much of a gift. Here's a piece of bread. It's still a piece of bread, but it symbolizes our friendship or something, you know? Here's a glass of wine. Yeah, you've got tons of wine at home, but this is a symbol of uh, uh, the covenant or something. I don't know. It's, Jesus wouldn't be giving something if he's just giving an empty symbol. It doesn't do anything. Here, have bread. I already have bread. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, I'll remember your love for us. I mean, he gave bread out and fish out at the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000. Those were miraculous events. To say that these are just symbols is to say that the Last Supper was a less important, less miraculous event than the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000. And throughout church history, that has just never been true. Rather, Jesus gave himself body and blood for Christians to receive. Because Jesus said, Hoc est corpus meum, this is my body, and this is my blood, even when we don't understand how that could be, we can trust his words. Turns out God knows what he's talking about. When he says, this is my body, I'm going to take his word for it. So when we receive the body and blood, we are actually uniting ourselves with Christ. We are actually uniting ourselves with God in a tangible way. In the same way we unite ourselves to the food that we eat. We have a union with Christ. Do this in remembrance of me, Jesus said. And even in the Old Testament reading, we see, this, we see this passage that talks about Passover, and this shall be a meal of remembrance, or a, a, a memorial meal for you. Do this in remembrance for me. In remembrance of me, excuse me. Now, perhaps as Americans, we take this word differently than he intended. For example, when we were told to remember the Alamo, it means something different. None of us were alive at the Alamo, not even my father, None of us were alive at the Alamo, so how can we remember something we weren't a part of? We weren't a part of the Alamo. I wasn't a part of that war. How can I remember it? So to remember the Alamo really only means to think about a historical event. Remember the Alamo. Remember George Washington crossing the, uh, the Delaware. Remember Abraham Lincoln's speech? Well, maybe you don't remember them, but think about them as historical things that are in the past disconnected from you. That's what we think do this in remembrance of me means as Americans. But that's not what Jesus is saying. When Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me, he is commanding something much more than thinking about an event we have no relation to. To participate in the Lord's Supper is not to think about an ancient event. It's not to, to, to look at a symbol and say, oh yeah, yeah, I remember Jesus did that somewhere in the Bible, okay. That's not what he's saying. But it's actually to be a part of the event. The Passover meal, when it was instituted, was not just, hey, remember that time when God saved you from Egypt. It was, you and all your descendants are participating in this ongoing meal. Likewise, the Lord's Supper, this was to be a part of the event, a part of the meal that began with the Last Supper, but hasn't ended. We may not have been there when the feast got started, but we can certainly be here as it continues. In this way, we celebrate the memorial meal, not by remembering the past, but by participating in the ongoing feast, by anticipating the feast to come in the resurrection. We are united with Christ's actual body, actual blood, through the bread and the wine. We are united with Christ's death on the cross through our participation in the meal. And since we are each united with Christ, we are also united with one another through him. Part of the beauty of the Lord's Supper is not just that we get to eat together as a congregation, those of us who are here, or if there are visitors from other congregations, that we get to eat together with them. That is beautiful. It is wonderful. But that's not the whole picture. In fact, we eat together not just with other members of the congregation here, but with every Christian. All the Christians who go to the Lord's Supper now and every Christian who has gone before us. So this past year, my mother died, and she went to heaven to be with Jesus. Now, many of you have lost loved ones as well. I know some of their names, some of their names I don't know. While I have the comfort of the resurrection, and Jesus is the resurrection and the life, I also have the comfort that when I'm at the Lord's table, when I'm at the Lord's Supper, I'm joined by my fellow Christians, not just here, 
but in heaven. Yes, including my mother. This body and blood of Christ in the Lord's Supper brings me, brings you into meal with Jesus. We are in a feast with Jesus. Through his body and through his blood, Jesus feeds your faith. He feeds you spiritually and he continues to take away your sin. This is why I say, go in peace, your sins are forgiven. Because that's what it does. Such a powerful thing, such a powerful blessing can be a danger though. This is what Paul talks about in the reading. He says that to receive the body and blood in an unworthy manner was a curse to some people. Some people got sick and even died because they received it in an unworthy manner. Now, it's not that they were unworthy because they were sinners. We're all sinners. In that respect, we're all unworthy of the gift that God gives us. But that's not what he's talking about. Rather, these people were opposed to the gifts of the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper does feed the faith. But what does it do to somebody who receives it without faith? The Lord's Supper does forgive sins, but what does it do to somebody who is unrepentant of their sin? Or somebody who refuses to forgive the sins of others? This is the danger, and this is why we take it so seriously. This is a powerful medicine. The ancient church called it the medicine of immortality. If you take a medicine when your body is not prepared to receive it, you can actually have harm come on you as a result of an otherwise life-saving medicine. This is the warning. This is the danger. And this is why people need to be examined before they receive the Lord's Supper. Through confirmation class, through the pastor having a community, talking with people and saying, okay, what do you believe? I want to make sure you know what you believe. Are you a sinner? Do you know that Christ died for your sins? What are the Ten Commandments? These are the sins that you've broken. These sorts of things. This is part of the examination. To make sure that you're not going to be hurt by receiving the Lord's Supper. Your pastor, as mean as I am, does not want to just exclude people. I don't have people out there say, well, uh, the riffraff, let's not have them in there. That's not the point. The point is that I, that we as a congregation love these people. We don't want to make them feel left out, but we want to prevent someone from being hurt by the Lord's Supper. If you've ever gone to Walgreens, the pharmacist tells you, okay, take this, take this prescription for this, this many times a day, and you're given instruction on how to receive medicine so it won't hurt you. We can at least be that thorough, at least be that loving with the medicine of immortality. If someone is of a different denomination, even another Christian, to eat together with us at the table confesses that we all believe the same thing. And this would be a lie. Or it would be confusing to those who are involved. I don't believe the same thing as a Roman Catholic, but they receive the body and blood of Christ. I don't believe the same thing as a Presbyterian, but they're still a Christian. I don't want to confess something that's a lie, that we all believe the same thing. If somebody is in ongoing, unrepentant sin, infidelity, cohabitation, any other sin that they don't repent of, they are in danger of receiving the Lord's Supper to their judgment. If somebody approaches the Lord's Supper, the Lord's table, but does so while refusing to forgive others, they are not promised the forgiveness of sins. So what might they receive instead? This is why we take this seriously. These things matter. With these considerations, because of how important God has taught us that the Lord's Supper is, we have an obligation to take this seriously. If God took this seriously, we probably should too. It was such a serious penalty for abusing the Lord's Supper. The blessing, the blessing for those who receive it in faith is infinitely greater. As much as we are concerned that we don't want anybody to be hurt from the Lord's Supper, we can rejoice in how much it can help those who are ready to receive it. The Christian should love the Lord's Supper as much as he loves the Lord. This is a special gift given for you. That phrase means a lot. For you. This is one of the ways that Jesus took on his sacrifice on the cross. That he took on your sin, forgave you of your sin, and took that and delivered it to you. In the word, if the words of Christ are precious, if the sacrifice of Christ is precious, if God's love is precious, then the Lord's Supper is precious because he considered you precious. 
So with all eagerness, with all joy, you are free to receive this gift as often as you are able. If you get to come to Sunday every week, every time we gather together, it is just as much a blessing every time. God wants you to receive this gift, to receive it often, to receive it with joy, to receive it regularly. Not to fear when you're unable to receive it, but to continue to yearn for it and value it when you can. Thanks be to God that your Savior loved you so much that he came to earth. He lived, he suffered, and died on the cross for your sins. Thanks be to God that your Savior paid your debt with his body and his blood. Thanks be to God that that Savior took that body and that blood, sacrificed once for all on the cross, and delivers it to you every week at the Lord's Supper. Thanks be to God that as you participate in his death, in his memorial meal, you are able to look forward to the day when you participate in a life like his, the resurrection in perfection to all eternity. And now the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Why did Christ have to die? Why did Christ have to die? This is the question that my children ask me. I don't want Jesus to die. Why did Christ have to die? Through one man sin entered the world. Through one man all men are saved. This is what the Bible tells us. When God created the world, he made it perfect. When he created the world and placed Adam and Eve in the garden, this perfect world, they enjoyed it. And they were made to enjoy it and made to work it. Adam and Eve, rather than remain faithful to God, Adam and Eve chose to rebel against him. They chose to act selfishly, to act sinfully, and as a consequence, sin entered into the world. They brought suffering into the world. The perfect creation was infected by the consequences of sin. And even the ground was cursed as a result. Why did Christ have to die on Good Friday? to undo the damage that our ancestors have done to the world. Although Adam and Eve sinned, since they started sinning, and mankind has since been infected with the temptation to sin, the desire to sin, we too sin actively to this day. It's not entirely the fault of Adam and Eve and those before us. We are actively disobedient to God. Even we Christians daily struggle with sin over and over. We struggle to do what is right. We struggle to avoid doing what is wrong. Temptation may be a result of Adam and Eve's sin, but our own participation is entirely willing. It's entirely our fault. The consequences of this sin, just like the consequences of the sin in the garden, is death. Why did Christ have to die on Good Friday? To cover the sins that we commit every day. In the Old Testament, people struggled with sin and the temptation to sin, just as we do. They would engage in sin, and death was the consequence for their sin. Specifically for these people in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, they would be required to go to the temple to perform sacrifices with animals, guilt sacrifices, guilt offerings. In the temple of the Old Covenant, the blood of animals would be presented as an offering to cover the sins of the people. Part of the sacrifice to cover the sins of the people. The priest would have to kill so many animals, so many animals on the day of sacrifice, that the streets, the rivers, and the valleys would be flooded with blood, permanently stained with the blood of the animals. And yet, no matter how many animals died, no, how many, no matter how many animals were sacrificed for the sins of the people, they would always need more. It was never good enough. But people would have to keep coming back with more and more animals, time and time again, sacrifice after sacrifice, to continue to cover their sins. There was no other way. Now, animal lives are not the same as human lives. They are neither as valuable, nor are they the same thing. Humans commit the sins, so ultimately it's necessary that the human life is the payment for sin. Animal sacrifice are always incomplete. They are always insufficient. So why did Christ have to die on Good Friday? Because no amount of animal sacrifice could ever pay for the sins of mankind. But if animal sacrifices were not enough, and the consequences of sin is death, then would a person be saved if they died? 
Would their own death pay for their life? No. The requirement for animals for a sacrifice was that they were perfect, that they were without blemish or spot, without fault, as close to perfect as possible. Now, any human who died as a sacrifice for his own life would have to fulfill that requirement. He would have to be perfect. His death could not pay, pay for any debt because nobody was a suitable sacrifice, not even for themselves. So why did Christ have to die on Good Friday? Because no one else had ever lived a perfect life, and no one else could have been a suitable sacrifice. But if there was a perfect person, a human who was not infected with sin and temptation of Adam and Eve, and he went his entire life without sinning, would this be an appropriate sacrifice? Could a perfect person die for the sins of all of mankind? Again, no. As valuable as a human life is, every human life, more valuable than every animal life, more than any amount of animal life, a human life is not enough to cover the sins of all of mankind. Would a single person, a single perfect human, presented as a sacrifice, pay for the sins of a single other human? Even if so, what about the rest of the sins, the rest of mankind? What kind of sacrifice would be valuable enough that it could cover all of the sins of all of mankind to pay for the sins, the lives of so many people? Why did Christ have to die on Good Friday? Because only the death of God himself could pay for the sins of all mankind. But with the death of Christ, fully man and fully God, death would have the last word. One life sacrificed for many, but lost forever. At least that would have been the case if Christ had stayed dead, if he had stayed in the tomb. As you know, this was never the plan. This was never the plan for Jesus to go to the tomb, to sacrifice his life for everyone, and to stay there. Christ gave up his life willingly on the cross, with no intention of staying there, with no intention of letting death rule. Instead, Christ died to defeat death in his resurrection. He laid down his life so that he could pick it back up. Christ allowed death to do its worst, and three days later, he walked out of that tomb, not with a body suffering from decay, but with an incorruptible and glorious body. Only God could have the power over death itself, and only Christ, as man, could allow death to afflict him. By doing this, God paid the way for your sins. He paid for your sins as a sacrifice and paved the road for you to follow in new life. Why did Christ have to die on Good Friday? Because only Christ could endure death, and only God could walk away from that victorious, a victory that he passed on to you. Why did Christ have to die on Good Friday? He died to fix the fallen world. Why did Christ have to die on Good Friday? He died to pay for our daily sin. Why did Christ have to die on Good Friday? He died because the blood of man was required for the sin of man. Why did Christ have to die on Good Friday? He died because no other man was worthy of being a sacrifice. Why did Christ have to die on Good Friday? He died because only the life of God could pay for the sins of all mankind. Why did Christ have to die on Good Friday? He died because only the power of God could conquer death. He died to forgive your sins, to reconcile you to the Father, and to grant you eternal life. Why did Christ have to die on Good Friday? Because he so loved the world. Now the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. He is risen. He is risen so when I was younger, I used to wonder about that phrase, he is risen. It kind of sounds like bad grammar, doesn't it? He is risen. When I would hear somebody say he is risen, or I would see it on a banner. Let's see if it on this banner. Yeah, Christ is risen. Yeah, see, Christ is risen. I would see it on a banner, or I'd hear it, and I'd wonder about it. Why not he was risen? Isn't that proper grammar? Or he has risen, past tense. Isn't that proper grammar? This is what was going through my mind when I was growing up. But the truth is that it, the grammar itself isn't bad. That's not what the issue is here. The grammar isn't bad. It's like Jesus' statement when he said, Before Abraham was, 
I am. Not before Abraham was, I was. Before Abraham was, I am. Catches you. It's, it's, it's a little off-putting because you want to you wanna crack the ground, but the grammar's not wrong. It's meant to convey something great, something unusual, something unique here. Now, in this case, when we say he is risen, we celebrate not just what Jesus did in the past, as though a couple thousand years ago, some guy died in a stick and then came out of the tomb. And we remember it like we remember the Alamo. That was just kind of a past event. That's not what we're doing here. When we say he is risen, we celebrate who he is, even now, who Jesus is even now. Now, in scripture, Jesus is known as the crucified one or the slain one upon the throne. The crucified one, even after the crucifixion, even after the resurrection. He is, to this day, the crucified one. He's not just one per, a, a person who at one point in history was crucified, but the identity of the Son of God crucified on the cross has eternal implications. Now this is why we don't sh shy away from depictions of Christ on the cross. You'll see up there, here, and then various other places, we have Jesus on the cross. Because that's who he is. He is the one who died on the cross, but he is the crucified one. He is the sacrifice. It's not that he was the sacrifice, and we're looking forward to another one, but he is, he continues to be the sacrifice, the crucified one. Even though it's a snapshot, even though Jesus died at a certain point in history, thousands of years ago, this event continues to affect us to this day. This continues to be his identity. We worship the crucified Jesus, but we also worship the risen Jesus. This isn't, it isn't just that Jesus rose from the tomb, but forever after, his identity is that of the risen man. He's not just alive. Oh, Jesus is alive. Well, what else is new? No, he's alive again. He's alive after having been dead. The risen Jesus is the Jesus who not only experienced death, but conquered over it. And he continues to reign over death. He is the risen one. He is risen. Your line is... He is risen indeed. Uh, <laughs> I was wondering how many times I might say it, and somebody would probably interject, he is risen indeed. So I prepared for that, just in case. But that's his identity as the risen one. During Good Friday service, I asked a question over and over again. Those of you who were here, hopefully I answered it. Does anybody remember the question? Anybody else remember the question? Uh, and, and if you were at the earlier service, feel free to, to shout out. What, what question did I ask on Good Friday? Why did he have to die? Why did Christ have to die? Why did Jesus have to die on Good Friday? Why? Now I explained the reconciliation with the Father, the forgiveness of sins, the, 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 the conquering over, over the fallen world, the sacrificial aspect, that it was a sacrifice on the cross. All the things that Jesus accomplished once for all on the sacrifice on the cross. He did it one time for all time. Jesus died on the cross because that was the way that God ch chose to so love the world. That's what that verse means. So with all of those things accomplished on the, on the cross, with the death on the cross, Jesus spoke a phrase. One of my favorite phrases in Greek to memorize. I don't speak a lot of Greek, but I know this one. To tell us time. It means it is finished. It doesn't mean it's almost finished. It doesn't mean... I did half the work, I did 99% of the work, now it's up to you to do the other 1%. To finish the sacrifice, to do your penance, to complete the sacrifice on the cross. He says, it is finished. It's done. We don't have to worry about what we need to con contribute to our salvation. We don't have to worry about this. When Christ died on the cross and he said, it is finished, there's nothing we could contribute even if we wanted to. Our salvation is already complete. It is finished means it is finished before we were even born, before we could even attempt to add to the cross. It is finished. Likewise, we don't have to worry about what if God is punishing me for my sin? This is a common fear that people have is that they'll commit a sin and then they'll experience grief, they'll experience sorrow, they'll experience sickness and they'll say, is God punishing me for my sin? Are you Christian? Yes. Then the answer, no. God already poured out all of the punishment for sin on Christ on the cross. If you are a Christian, you are not being punished for your sin. Now, 
Your sin may have temporal consequences. In the military, we say a phrase. We say, play stupid games, win stupid prizes. If you do something that causes harm, that harm exists. But God is not punishing you for your sin. God punished Jesus for your sin. The entire wrath of God is fully poured out on Christ on the cross for your sin. You never have to ask the question, is God punishing me for my sin? It is finished. It means that the wrath of God, the wrath of the Father for sin was poured out already completely. The cup of wrath is empty. So, if it is finished, and it is, what was left to accomplish? Why do we celebrate Easter if it was all finished on the cross? Well, your salvation was won on the cross. With Christ's death on the cross, he accomplished victory over sin and the devil. He paid for your sin entirely. But with his resurrection from the tomb, he accomplished victory over death itself. Death is the last enemy to, to be defeated, he says. The victory over death itself. Death could not hold him. It lost. Now remember all the way back in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve screwed everything up for everybody. All the way back in the Garden of Eden, this whole mess started when they interacted with the devil. And he said, did God really say dot, dot, dot? Then they ate the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They chose to sin. First they sinned, then they died. First sin, then death. Now that's a curse. The curse of sin is death. The consequence of sin is death. But Christ reversed that curse with his death and turned it into a blessing. First, he paid for sin. Then he overcame death. First sin and then death. Now over the course of the Bible, various people were raised from the dead. By Elijah, by Elisha, by the power of God through these people. In the New Testament, too, people were raised from the dead by the power of God. But nowhere in the Bible before Jesus did anybody willingly submit to death and then walk out of the tomb on their own accord. Not until Jesus. So when Jesus, what Jesus accomplished on Easter morning by becoming the risen one, because he is risen, I'm going to get as much, as much use out of that as I can. Because, be, because of this, because he's become the risen one, this was a demonstration of God's power over death. He wasn't reaching in and pulling someone else out of the grave, but he, was, he willingly said, give it your best shot, death, and death did. And it wasn't good enough. God overcame death itself. He defeated the last enemy, which is death. He didn't just do this for himself, though. He didn't just get back out of the tomb on his own accord. He got back out of the tomb as a promise to all you believers, all you Christians, that the same will happen to you and to every one of your loved ones who have fallen asleep in Christ. Now, the Bible calls Jesus the firstborn from among the dead. This doesn't mean that Jesus was the first one raised from the dead. Again, in the Old Testament, some people were raised from the dead already. But when he walked out of the tomb, suffering and death could no longer touch him. He was the first one eternally released from suffering, sickness, illness, and death. Jesus rose in the same way that he promises that you will rise on the last day. Not that your spirit will go to heaven and then God will give you a new body afterwards. And he says, you know, pick from the rack. Uh, you get that one. That was a little bit taller. That one's better at sports. Uh, that was pretty smart. No, you don't get a new body, but that your body will be raised. Now, you remember... When Jesus visited the disciples afterwards, then later on to become the apostles, what does he have in his hands? The nail marks. What did he have in his side? The spear mark. He didn't have a new body. He had a new body. Why would he have any scars? But this was to prove that it was the same body, risen and perfected and glorified, never again to be hurt, never again to be sick, never again to die. And this is the promise God has for you. First born from among the dead, and you all are to follow. On the last day, your body will be raised, will be glorified and reunited with your spirit in heaven. And eternally after, it will be perfect. It will be your body. Not a replacement, but your body, perfected. So we can confidently say that Jesus is the crucified one. This is a depiction of the God we worship. Jesus is the crucified one. Jesus is 
the risen one. And you are the forgiven one. Through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, and through the work when he walked out of that tomb, your identity as well has been changed. Jesus Christ was once dead and is now risen. You were once dead to sin and are now alive in Christ. Since Christ is risen, you will be too. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. And now the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.